Welcome to Temple of Pwn. This week we'll be talking about some kernel exploitation and getting into the hows and whats and those things. So, usual attacks on the kernel, probably buffer overflows or some kind of overflow type, either whether it be stack or heap-based, use after freeze, and race conditions. There's probably more out there and a lot of them kind of can come and go. Could just be like crappy programming, maybe there's a missed test case or use condition. That could lead to something, but these are kind of the usual that people will find in the real world or that are competition based. So first we'll talk about some of the protections. This usually includes kernel ASLR, so KSLR. This protects against buffer overflows in the stack and probably some use after freeze because if you don't have the address or an address that you want to kind of control, you don't know where you are, this will limit your kind of breadth of availability. So with KSLR, why not just jump to shellcode and user space, since we can probably have a good understanding of where that is if we're running our own program, and if we have control, then we should be able to just do that naturally. So this is where SMEP comes in, Supervised Remote Execution Protection. This limits the attacker's ability to just jump straight to user space while running in a kernel context. Um, this is this will help limit the UF to use up to freeze and buffer overflows and all that stuff. This is kind of the second main protection that's in use nowadays. Um, with different attacks, you could still gain execution, but and there's different ways you have to bypass SMAP, and we'll talk about those. And the other one is SMAP now. SMAP is Supervisor Memory Access Protection. So if you're not allowed to execute the user space, if it's only SMAP, you'd still be able to access data from there. So maybe you have the ability to modify R or control RSP. You could set up a ROP chain in user space still. And this is where SMAP comes into uh, into practice. This will limit your ability to actually contact that data without going through specific functions, which are right here, copy to user and copy from user. And those are the only ways you're actually supposed to be able to access user space data uh, correctly or safely without interfering with kernel protections. So with all three of these in place, it kind of comes down to bug hunting. So you'll need to be able to probably leak some memory or just find partial overwrite to be able to go to, and there's a correct lineup maybe. It just comes down to the nitty gritty at that point. So we'll talk a little bit about the control registers. So the main ones are CR4 and CR3 that we'll talk about. So CR4 kind of controls the current operations in kernel mode. This is what controls the SMAP and SMEP protections, and this is able to be written in live. So if you're able to get a wrap chain going, you're actually able to turn off SMAP and SMEP. Um, sometimes it's useful to do that, sometimes it's probably more uh, pressure or more, it's harder to do that than it is to actually find a different way to get control. And CR3 controls paging tables in virtualization modes. Uh, this mostly comes into place or play with Chemu or other kind of virtualization methods in the kernel. Uh, you'll just need to keep tabs on it if it's, there's some times where you won't need to care about it, but other times you'll need to specifically reset CR3 so you're able to jump back to user space when you have your exploit done. So some kernel structures, um, a lot of times if you're using use after freeze or just overflows, you kind of want to affect a certain structure. And some of the useful structures are, oh, I didn't put the link in here, but I'll talk about it later. Some of the uh, most important structures are probably the credential structure. So this will define what your current, uh, current credentials are. Usually you just go in there and have to change two keywords from probably 1000 if that's what you use your ID and group ID are to zero or something and that'll make you be root if you can find your current credential struct but this could be kind of hard because there's no as far as I know there's no just like single pointer that points it you have to like manually search through memory and find it yourself so next we have just some P other structures uh, PTY I think that has to do with well work with PTY struct today but the way we'll be working with it is kind of in the file, kind of file sense, I guess. Yeah, message struct is kind of just a struct you can use for heap, uh, heap spraying. You can just send message if you do just a uh, send message. I don't know if it has to be through a socket or just like send it to yourself or something. You're able to just spam a bunch of data into the kernel heap. This could be useful if you're trying to set up a wrap chain or something and don't have the exact location. So kernel wrap, so we've I've talked about a little bit. Whoops, still viable, but you'll need a leak, probably some overflow or a way to control it. 
and then there's the typical wrap chains is most of the times they'll just do prepare kernel cred with the, called to zero this will usually create a kernel cred in the or kernel credential structure in a, the context of credential zero usually you are like i think to actually use the prepare kernel cred structure correctly you have to pass it an actual kernel structure or kernel credential structure that you've already created but if you just pass it to zero it'll just create a root context one for you and the commit creds will pass this structure onto your current instance so it'll overwrite your current credentials and make you root if you can get this entire chain ran um, but the returning to user land is kind of the tricky part of a lot of ROP chains. This has to do with the fact of the CR4 and CR3 registers and that you have to have a certain path to actually jump back to user land. So you can't just jump back to it because of SMAP and SMAP. Um, you have to have specific instructions be called. So swap GS, it just prepares the transfer for to user space. I can't remember off the top of my head what this actually modifies uh, register wise, but I'm pretty sure it modifies one of the CR registers and just tells it that we're about to swap. And then IRET Q, this will pull the user space information from the stack. So you just have to have everything ready. So you have to have your stack information, some of the register information, and then probably your uh, other kind of control register information. So when it, re when it returns, it knows where to return to. So it's kind of similar to a SIG return in this recent sense where you have everything on the stack and you just return. So as I mentioned earlier, CR3 may need to be updated also because in some virtualization slash paging methods, uh, the current CR3 won't point to the correct paging table that would be needed when you return to user space. And I'll show an example here where it actually will, GDB will show that we correctly returned and are calling our current function, but since CR3 was never modified, it just crashes on us right away and it just gives us a seg fault. And once we figure out that's our problem, we will use a gadget just what we refer to as ret to um, just return to user mode. I don't know why or where this is actually referred to as. Um, I have a source that I was pointed to when I first learned about it, but I don't actually know why we would call it ret to um. I mean, it makes sense to return to user mode, but... No one, I've never actually seen anyone else actually refer to this to as ret to um besides where I've seen it, or besides the one spot I've been mentioned it before. So ret to um, well, this will fix CR3 for us. We'll do the swap GS and iret Q. As long as we have everything on the stack and we return to this one address, we pretty much just have a single chain that just rides all the way back down to user space for us. And it's really useful. So now we get to interacting with kernel modules. So a lot of times kernel modules are loaded into the kernel space, I guess, modularly. Uh, most of the CTF instances will be through the modules. They're usually loaded at boot, so you don't actually have to load them. And this will usually create a character device inside probably forward slash dev or maybe forward slash proc. Don't quote me on that one. Um, so interacting with kernel modules. Uh, most of the times it's kind of just like interacting with a file. You can open them, read, or write, um, and then here's the example. So if you can read it, it'll have a device read function. If you can write to it, device write function, device open when you open it. Otherwise, it's also usually interacted with the system called IOCTL. And this can be done, this will have a device IOCTL then function to handle any IOCTL, which stands for input output control, I think. But yeah. So we'll talk a bit about debugging also. I think this is the last slide, yeah. Usually with, so usually when you're running these kind of challenges or kind of want to get a better sense, you probably run it through Chemu because it's easy to debug that way. Uh, you could probably debug a live instance, but you'll have to compile the kernel to allow that and it's just probably more hassle than it's worth. So uh, another recommendation is to probably turn off KSLR. Uh, SMAP and SMEP, you could turn them off if they're on, but if you want to, kind of work in a better context of the binary, it's best to leave those on. The reason I turn off KSLR is because it's easier to debug with GDB then. And you could just load the module at a certain address once and it'll always be at that address. Whereas if it's still on and you reload every time, it'll have to be done with a new location. And you can load these symbols with add symbol file or the modules with add symbol file. And I'll show you that in a little bit. So with that out of the way, we'll kind of go into this challenge that I have prepared. 
So this challenge is called Baby Beta Driver. It's from the Hack the Box uh, final CTF that happened last month. I don't remember actually when it was. Uh, there were a good amount of solves on it, I think, and it was supposedly their hardest challenge. Um, whether I'm pretty sure all of the public write up or all the write ups should be public by now, so we should be fine to go over it. First, we just had to unzip what we got, and we can see that we unzipped three files with BZ image uh, in it, RAM RF, or RAM FS CPIO, and run dot underscore challenge sh. So the BZ image usually controls all of the kernel information, and that's kind of pretty much it. Init RAM C, I'm pretty sure that's pretty much it. The init RAM file system, whatever CPIO is, kind of holds the file system that we'll be working with. And then the run underscore challenge is just the command that's actually being ran. So here we can look at it just running chemu underscore our system. So it's x86-64, it's not ARM. Uh, but it's important to know this dash s will set up debugging availability on chemu. So nothing really changes except for it will open up port 1234 for GDB to connect to. Next we can see that PTI is on. This is page table in indexing, I think. Don't quote me on that either. Um, the fact that this is on means that there's probably a good chance we'll need to modify CR3, and even if it's off, there's still probably a good chance you modify CR3, so it's probably just a good idea to do that in general. KSLR, uh, and then down here, the CPU, you'll see SMEP and SMAP are also enabled. Um, it could be good to look to see if there's the number of cores and the number of threads. So if the number of threads was two, it could have possibly been a race condition, but based on the fact that we have one thread, uh, Cores equals two doesn't actually mean there's two cores. I don't, I don't actually know how that works, because we can look at the CPU cores information in the actual when we run it, and we can see that there's only one recognized. So maybe, so if we look at cat proc CPU info, we can only see that only one processor is actually noticed. So maybe something's up with that. I don't know. But first, we'll turn off KSLR, just so we don't forget about it. Next, we're going to want to actually see what our uh, what our file system and kind of the files we're working with actually look like and modify them so we have root access when we actually run these challenges. So it allows us to, having root access will allow us to figure out where our module is actually loaded. I mean, we could guess based on how it usually be loaded in this kind of scenario, but for those who have never done it before, it's just good to have the root aspect already available to us to see how everything's working. So inside temp, I'm going to copy init RAM RFS. I actually don't need to. I think I do CPIO dash IDB. Is that right? Oh, it was. Nice. All right, so here we have our kernel module that's actually here, and we'll look at the init quick. So here we just have a bin sh. Um, what's the, really what's really important is that it adds a user, probably sets some stuff up, will load our module right here, and then set the module to be 666, so read and write, and then set the flag to be read only by root, um, and then change the directory to home CTF. So I'm going to get rid of this command and then change this one from setting our UID to 0 to be, or from 1000 to be 0. So when we run it, it should be, uh, should work correctly. And then now that we have the baby beta driver, we can copy it and then actually open it in debugger, which we'll get once we fix this. Um, now nah, it should be. We'll just go to the debugging real quick. Yeah. All right. So there's not many functions available to this one. Um, there's an init beta. This will just initialize it. This is what usually gets called when you ins mod something. So this just creates the character device. We'll set the device number, the major number, and all that stuff. We'll probably print some stuff. So device create, class create, kernel, or print k will just be printing the kernel. Uh, beta major number registered. Uh, nothing really is out of the ordinary. There's no functions for open, crew or open read, write, or X, I don't think there's ever one for execute, open read or write, but that doesn't really matter, but there is one for the IOCTL. 
and we can kind of look through it. So we can see that there's a mutex lock, but that doesn't, it's not really important to us, but this also helps confirm that this isn't a race condition vulnerability because we're not gonna be able to kind of break out of this context once the mutex is locked and we can't really interfere with it. So first we have a copy from user. So this is one of the main functions that's used to copy data when SMAP is uh, enabled. And we can see that we have two arguments, RDI and RSI. These will be something the user controls and then just it loads into RSP. So there's an address we have to pass in that's gonna set our load 10 hex or 16 hex, like 10 hex I guess, bytes from the user. And then it'll compare RBX to lead code or to code lead. So what's really important is when you call IOCTL, there's gonna be three three parameters you send in with it. There'll be the file descriptor pointing to a current module or file you've opened for this. Uh, the second one will be what EBX will be. So our second one will be our code that we're gonna send it. And the third one will be this pointer that's arg. It could be a little confusing on trying to figure it out, but I think Ida right here is showing us this where arg is rdx, rsi, and rti. But yeah. So we'll kind of walk through this a little bit. I'll try and hit all the major points and talk about everything thoroughly. So it looks like first we see that there's this request at size and beta storage that size. So it looks like Ida's already kind of uh, notice that there's a structure here. So let's see if we can go to our structures and look at it. We have storage. Here we go. And it looks like the storage is size of 10 hex, which is what's copied from us. Uh, size is going to be an integer. There's going to be four bytes of padding. And then there's going to be a data pointer poss possibly. So that kind of lines up with what we have so far. So first we can check. We can check to see that it does request.size, assuming this is the 10... The request is the beginning of the 10 bytes that are copied from us. Request that size. It'll then store this size into the beta storage size. We'll grab the current beta storage data pointer. And if it's zero, it'll go on. If it's not zero, it'll free it. Then it will take the size, put in RDI, RSI, some flags, and KMALC. KMALC is just the kernel equivalent of malloc. Um, the flags don't really matter in our context. Nothing is out of the ordinary. Usually you'll see CC0. Um, it kind of just means on how to create the data. There's other ways to malloc also, but we don't really need to worry about those right now. So if once it malloc's, it'll then store this into bait the local saved one. It'll then grab our transfer data pointer. So assuming this will just be the data pointer for us, test it. If it's not zero, it will make sure that the size is less than or not negative integer. And then it'll copy from user. And then we'll have a print k once we're all done. I mean, if we check to see what it says, it probably just says something like send data good. So nothing to. So this, if we go down this path, it looks like it deletes any current allocations and creates a new one. And then we'll copy data if we allow it. So next we have code leap. Um, we check to see if our request at size is less than or equal to the current size that's allocated. Whoops. If it is, it'll then mem copy that size to a temporary storage, which appears to be on the stack with LEA. Then it'll grab our request transfer data, make sure that's not zero, and then check our size again to be if it's 0x30 or not. And we'll copy this to the user if it is if it's less than or equal. So it looks like we can copy 0x30 bytes, 30 hex bytes, yeah, 0x30 hex bytes, whatever, uh, to the user with copy to user if everything lines up correctly. And then if not, then just prints and says it's all good still, and then we'll unlock, and that's kind of all of our module is. So the important thing to notice here is that while there is a check for 0x30, 30 here because uh, temp storage is 30 hex characters. We can see 48, so it all lines up there. But there's no check up here for the 0x30 before it's mem copied from the kernel space to the stack, which allows us to get a uh, buffer overflow quite easily. The only problem with this is that first we need to find a way to leak an address, and to do that, we'll, I'll discuss that in a little bit. But once we copy all the data onto the stack, 
it doesn't really matter if we copy back to the user because we probably are the ones who put the data there. And then we can just go through and once it hits this return, we should have control of the stack. So with that out of the way, now we should probably just set up kind of the baseline, um, kind of what you want to have in place when working with these kinds of challenges. So what I like to do, I have a simple just exploit.c is kind of just a blank canvas, kind of just has all of the libraries we'll be importing, just so it does less, or throws less error or warnings at us, and then it just has main. So first I'm going to have a little build.sh. Um, we'll just have gcc compile our exploit.c, do out, we'll just call it exploit, we'll copy exploit to temp, we'll change directory to temp, we're going to rm, we're going to do this inside temp because we're just going to create a new one here. Uh, don't worry about this line right now, but then we're going to do a find period within the temp context, pipe that to cpio dash o dash h new c uh, oops and i think it's init ram file system dot cpio i think that's all we need so what this will do is it'll change the temporary directory uh just remove the current cpio if there's one there and then create a new one so we can modify the file system because right now this is just copy of it it's not actually mounted temp so we actually need to rebuild it every time we create the exploit otherwise we have to find a harder way to move the binary in there so chmod plus x to build so that looks like it worked so we need to change run again to use that new init ram RF rfs so also talk about the arguments a little bit um i don't actually know what those officially stand for i just know that the file type of this init ram rfs is created with no crc and cvr4 and that's what the dash h new w or new c does um, i think dash o just creates a new one so if we weren't if we were just do dash o and then exclude this stuff it'll create a cpio archive it just won't create the one that the chemu library is expecting and there's pretty much nothing wrong with that, I guess. So if we check our ID, we're now root because we modified the init library or whatever. So this allows us to actually check out the call sims. And we're just going to grep for beta. And we can actually see where it's loaded now. If we weren't root, these numbers would all be blank or zero, I'm pretty sure. But now we know that the module is always loaded at this address. And we can set it up GDB to connect to it. But... We also want to see if our exploit is found, which it's not found. And if we try and figure out, well, file's not found, but uh, probably cat it. You can see that it's there, and we know it's there. It's not like zero or something. And this is the reason because this kernel image and file structure don't actually have like a full library environment. So when we actually build it, we're going to need to build it statically. So we'll do dash static. I think that's not the right. It's just dash static. Did you mean? Oh, I got to spell it right. Static. There we go. And we run it again, and we should be able to run the exploit. We don't have it do anything right now, but that's fine. As long as we're actually able to get it to run. So next, we're going to actually open the file character device and work with it. So we'll do int file descriptors equal to open. I think it's in dev slash baby beta driver. Um, we're only going to open it with read write abilities because we can't execute it or anything. And we're going to check to make sure it actually worked. So if file descriptor is less than zero, we'll do a print f failed to open. Exit zero. Then if it does, we'll do a printf, say device is at fd. So can't forget to build, because if we forget to build, then it won't actually modify anything. So we just gotta do that every time. 
exploit. And it looks like it successfully opens at three every time. Or it should at least. Exploit. Yeah. Okay, now with that out of the way, we can actually start to actually work with the IOCTL a bit. So first, let's create the little structure. So we had type def struct, we'll call it request. And we had the integer size. Um, we had int padding. Uh, we could probably omit the padding and it probably should work out, but uh, the problem that could occur is that GCC might somehow optimize the spacing and move these around so this way hopefully it doesn't do that uh, we could probably force it not to but I don't care too much about it as long as it's in the correct order so we can do request a just do a dot size we'll do 0x200 oops a dot data is equal to malloc of 0x200 and then we'll also do a memset a dot data We'll set it all to one to see if it actually gets or sends it. And then we'll do IOCTL, the first one, FD0X. I think it was code wheat, just to create. Not wheat code was create. So we want to create one first. Elite code. And then the address of A is where we want to have it copy the data from. So with that all there, we should be able to build it if I... Why? Oh, I guess I'll type right. Type def. Oops. There we go. We can run it, and this will be a good time to connect GDB to it. Um, I'm going to... This is one of the one times I like to use a pwn debug instead of... instead of Jeff and I'll show you why. So if we actually if we use Jeff, use GDB, do Jeff dash remote one two three four. This is kind of the context we get. Uh, for some reason none of the registers ever work and I'm not sure if it's just a current version bug or if I broke something somehow. I've just never been able to fix it. So if we go back to pwn debug and do GDB, whoops and do target remote one two three four we actually have a better context and actually looks nice so now we want to add our symbol file this will be in temp slash baby driver beta driver whatever this will be at 0x one two three four c one two three yeah so now we should be able to break at beta underscore iocTL and it looks like it's correctly all lined up. Let's check to see if it actually works. And we correctly did break there. Perfect. So now we can walk through. Uh, we come to the first call, and I went past it. That was the mutex lock. Second call will be the copy from user. We can check to see what's an RDI and what's an RSI. So RSI points to our A structure. RDI will just be the, st uh, the stack, so nothing is really important there. Um, what's important to know is that RAX will return zero if it works, and then if it fails, it'll return the number of bytes it was unable to copy. This could be useful in the future for some challenges. Probably not for this one, though. Um, next, it's going to compare EBX. EBX was our elite code value that we passed in. Since it's good, it goes down to e moves the current request size into EAX. We'll test out the current uh, storage data to see if it's full. If it's not, it'll, or if it is, it'll free it. If it's not, It'll go on. Then we'll come down to the K malloc. So RSI will be the flags. RDI will be 200. So give us the kernel uh, location. Just copy that real quick. We could check to see what's in there right now, but we're about to overflow it. But it could be important maybe if there's some kind of way to leak it. But the way it looks right now is that it has a kernel heap uh, pointer and then a current or uh, user space libc address and then a user space stack address uh, you're able to tell the difference based on pretty much just the number of f's that are kind of in the value uh, this could be actually it's not really sure what that is it could be anything 
this could be a stack address and this could just be some even further stack address um, or I can't even be allowed to look at it so it's just the fact that this is all just garbage and there's no actual useful kernel leaks in this piece of data right now besides maybe the heap but even with that alone you're probably gonna have a tough time working with anything because there's no guarantee that the heap will always be at a good offset from the actual kernel location so yeah so next we'll go down to the copy from user and then we can check out our data and see that it copied all those ones correctly uh, nothing else really happens and our exploits done at that point so we'll just leave GDB open probably for the rest of the exploit creation. So since KSLR is enabled, or it's kind of disabled in our context, but the actual binary itself has it, or the actual challenge itself has it, we need to find a way to leak it. And a way we can leak it is by bypassing this copy from user. Because as long as this copy from user isn't specified, the KMALIC will never, or KMALIC will never zero out data from a mal chunk it just assumes that it's will know how to handle it it's or the uz i think is how it's referred will know how to handle it so the way to bypass this handle from user is just to have our our transfer data just be zero and it just bypass it right away so if we create a size have our request data be zero we'll have a chunk with whatever data was left in there and then we come down this path we can copy it back to us only 30 hex bytes of it, yes, but it's still more data than we originally had. So let's we'll write that up real quick. So I can get rid of those two. We'll just say a.data is equal to zero just to be safe. So that should create the chunk of 0x200 bytes. Then we want to have a.data be. Can I just paste it? Yeah. Uh, we don't care about the mem set anymore. We just want to have an actual chunk. Then we can have IOCTL FD 0x code delete address of A. Um, nothing will really change with the structure of IOCTL ever. It's pretty much just these two options. But we need to change the size from 200 now down to 30 because we can't get a copy back from us based on the reversing. Unless we actually have a 30 hex chunk or less than 30 hex data. So once that copies back, we can do just a for loop, just to print it out. So x30, x plus equals eight. Uh, there's probably more delicate ways to do this, but this is kind of just how I like to do it, llx. Then we can do dereference a long, long pointer type cast to a dot data plus x. I think that should correctly work. Um, we're going to build it, run. We don't really care to attach to it, I don't think, but we could see that we successfully print these data back and it kind of looks like the same thing it was last time. Um, I think if we just keep running it, it should give us back the same stuff because the k-free should free the same chunk and it should give us back based on it's the newest chunk freed. So the next point is to kind of figure out what's a good way to actually get a useful item or address inside that location. And that's where the kernel structures that I mentioned came from before. And here's our notes. No, not the notes. Um, I just have it linked. I was going to put this address in the slides. So this is from a Japanese blog who does a lot of CTF challenges. Um, and in here, he just talks about a lot of different kernel structures. So we have SHM file data. That's a size of 0x20. We could get this, but uh, this looks like it only points to the heap er area and doesn't actually give us any good leaks. Uh, that actually looks, those both look good, like good leaks. But what we're going to go down for is instead of any of these, we're going to come down for the TTY struct. So it looks like it's a size of 0x2e0. And we can create it just by opening dev ptmx. So that's an easy enough for us to do. So we can get fairly confident control of this and get a use after, not really use after free, but unintended left data for us to use. Uh, it looks like the leak will just be a ptm unix 
operations. Uh, I'll discuss what that actually is when we get to it. So if we oops, go back into the exploits, we can do all of these. We'll do four, what we'll do int FDs. We'll just do 50 of them. So right now we're just gonna do a heap spray just to make sure that we have plenty of possibilities that it actually hits one of those structures when we allocate it some memory. So we'll do FDS X equal to open dev ptm x and we'll do read write executable um i'm not sure if that actually matters but i'm just gonna stick with it since it's worked for me so far paste and we'll just do a close of file x so all we're doing is opening and closing them and this should give us enough on the stack we need to make sure our size is relatively similar i think if we i don't quote me on this but i pretty sure that the kernel heap will allocate chunks based on similar range of sizes so in this case it would be 0x200 would default to 0x actually you know i think that i think it will default to 0x200 size but it doesn't sound right but 0x300 should default to 0x 400, I think. It kind of goes like the 4, 16, not the 4, 16, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, those kind of chunks. Um, just kind of different table or page, not really page tables. Um, can't remember the name at the moment, but if I think of it during the exploit, I'll say it. But there's kind of just different ways that it allocates memory. It's just through these kind of different chunks. So we're going to make sure our size is as close as possible, so we actually grab the, the similar chunk. Uh, this data malloc doesn't really matter too much, since we're only copying 30 bytes. And if we go into build, run, we'll reattach, continue. Uh, we'll do exploit. So we have the first IOCTL. The second one should go through. Um, and we can see that we have a different leak. So we have dead dead not really sure what the point of that is we have another heap one but then we have this address right here and if we were to look in proc call sims and grep for this oops grep for this address we can see that it's the ptm unix whatever 98 ops that was claimed to be so with that if we were to and show you what it actually is address so right now the operations just pretty much points to a bunch of different file operations so here this one will actually point to we'll need to cat them every time we got to continue otherwise we can't actually work with it open this up uh, this one points to ptm lookup uh, this is whoops ptm install uh, the important ones are these last couple i'm pretty sure i mean they're all pretty much important but you can force these last ones like pty open i think this is close and i think this is right no clean up and this one must be right hopefully yep so what these are what the importance of this is that since it's writable within the first uh, 20 hex bytes, if you're able to get an overflow or a use after free and you're able to overwrite this structure, you can control the PTY of that character device that you've opened. So maybe if you overwrite the write or overwrite the structure to your own created structure, you can create a fake write so you're able to get further control, maybe get to a stack pivot or something. and pretty useful at that point now you have to make sure that you clean up the structure at the end though because if you don't it'll crash probably when you try to return back to user space and execute a new shell but nothing really to worry about that what is important is that we have this address right here um i think the base will be this i think the base is at eight one zero zero 
let me check my notes real quick because looking it up is kind of a pain yeah so all I have to do is subtract this leak because this address will always be the same or this ending address will always be the same the first couple of bytes will or these bytes right here will all differ possibly because of the KSLR but through this we're able to get a successful leak and continue from there oh, it's not quite it's just detach so back to the exploit, we can continue to print it, doesn't really matter. We do unsigned long long leak is equal to long long oops. pointer a dot data plus zero x eighteen. I wanna say zero eight ten eighteen, yeah. So then we can do unsigned long long Base is equal to leak minus zero x six two three c six zero. And I'll probably just print it to make sure. Print f uh, base is at zero x percent l l x uh, base. And then I also like to do a if base is less than zero x one two three four one two three four. Uh, it means we failed to leak it uh, because the kernel address should always be loaded at something that begins with a 0x FFF. Uh, one second, I gotta charge my head for the set quick. There we go. Okay, right. uh, darn batteries. So yeah, so if this fails to leak, then you pretty much just failed that attempt. But with this method, we should always have a successful leak of some sort. So now we can continue with that leak. We can actually start setting up a ROP chain of some sort. Um, we'll need to find some ROP gadgets for that. And the correct way to just do everything from there. So we have this BZ image, but that's not actually the kernel code itself. It has a lot more to it. Um, I don't know everything that's in it, but we're just going to pull out the kernel image itself or the kernel code and use that for our ROP gadgets. And to do that, we can do a, oh man, what was it called? Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. I literally just did this command a little bit ago. Extract VM Linux. There we go. Extract VM Linux. Uh, this isn't, I'm pretty sure this isn't actually like usually in Linux. You'll have to pull it, and it's typically based on the current kernel, I think, is how it grabs the image or data, but I could be wrong with that. And I think, I think since we're so similar in points that it's correctly able to extract it. So if you don't have. A similar uh, ex kernel or current kernel uh, to the image you're working with, you might have to manually build the Linux or the kernel image to get the code, which could be a pain in the butt. But this should pull out the kernel image. And if we look at it, oops, file, file, VM Linux, we can see that it's just a uh, regular elf now. And if we do object dump dash t, let's see if this actually works. Nope, no symbols. Doesn't pull out the symbols correctly, but we don't really need the symbols. So we'll go wrapper, go no color, and we'll just save them to. Oh, misspelled that, but that's fine. We'll save them all because it takes a little bit for it to pull all the gadgets, and we don't want to have to keep running it every time to find a new gadget. So the main gadgets we'll need is probably RDI, RSI, possibly. I don't think we'll need RDX. Because our ultimate goal is to call prepare kernel threads or prepare kernel creds with zero and then commit creds with those results. So we'll need to find a way to move the results from RDI to RAX, no RAX to RDI to call commit creds. And then we'll just need the ret to um from that, I think. So for cat gadgets, I don't like that. Move gad to gadgets cat gadgets and we'll grep for pop rdi ret uh, we have 
pick one right here. Um, since we know the base, it looks like it should be at this offset, I think. I'm pretty confident that's the offset, yeah. So let's go back into this. Just start creating our gadgets. Go unsigned, long, long, RDI. It's equal to this address plus the base. Um, I'm going to just copy a bunch of these and probably rewrite it a little bit. Just do it like that. So now we have all these. We'll grab one for RSI. I don't think we'll need RSI, but we might. So this looks like it's just at 5C0. Zero. Zero. Zero X, 5C0. Zero. We'll need one for... I'll show you the swap GS swap GS method. Uh, that should be good. Swap GS plus. Then we need an I ret Q. Uh, this should work. Then we need to find a way to move the value from RAX to RTI. Um, we could check for exchange RAX RTI, which there is one, but it calls the pointer RSI, which isn't bad. Most of the times it could be a lot more convoluted, so we'll actually go with that one. So we'll go RAX underscore RTI. Oops, didn't want to delete that. Um, it's with something complicated, more complicated like this, you might want to copy the whole thing to show what's actually happening. So then we'll also need probably just a regular ret in this case, since our... just want regular ret. Since we're calling, or since this one calls RSI, we'll need just have our... our actually, ret won't work, we'll need a pop ret. So I guess we just use RDI again. No, we can't. We can use RSI again. There. We just need to get that return off before we actually return to the next gadget. Um, that should be it for this part. We just need the prepare creds and commit creds. And sadly, since the, the data didn't transfer with the VM Linux, we'll need to run the challenge again to actually find the offsets. So we do cat proc call sims grep for prepare kernel creds. This looks at 53B0. I'm going to put this off to the side real quick. Um, yep, and then we'll do commit creds. save that one as well. Those are really close to each other. Nice. Um, if you were going to swap or modify the CR4 register, you might be able to find a gadget for it, but there's also just straight functions that let you modify it. So native write. I think this just takes RDI and just sets it. Set bits might take R the bit number from RDI and sets them. Um, but there's probably some gadgets for it too. Grep for CR4. Yeah, see, the move CR4 RDI. Uh, but it does a bunch of other stuff right here. And most of the time, this has to. This is just what's probably inside the native write itself. There's probably a good chance you won't pass this jump greater than check and ret right away. So you probably have to go through and it'll fix up CR4 for other purposes. Uh, CR3 is also a possibility. You could like just move CR3 RAX, but it's a little bit harder to know what CR3 should point to, so usually I just avoid it. But now that we have this ROP chain, uh, we need to first figure out what our overflow ability is. So we know that if we, we can copy from user and we can mem copy, but we don't really care about the data being copied back to us, so we can put as much as we want. But since it's being put on the stack, which looks like it's at 0x40, we'll need to pad that out. There's also a pop command and pop arg. So I'm not 
confident on the total number we'll need, but I think it should be the 0x40 and just these two. And then just the RET, since there's no RVP cleanup either. So possibly 0x50 data. Maybe still only four. Well, I guess since CMD is actually RBX, ARG is R12. Yeah, neither of those matter. I was going to say if one of these was RDI, we could maybe save a step, but we'll work with it. So we have A data is equal to 0x200. That should be enough, I think, for what we need. So I'm going to do int i is equal to 0, and then we'll do unsigned bon bon pointer uh, prop chain is equal to a.data. Just, just make a, qu a quick conversion. I think it'll probably give us a warning, so I might as well typecast it. Pointer. I think that should be good. So we'll do a wrap chain at i is equal to zero. Oops, i plus plus. Let's do this. One, two, three, four, five. For some reason, I think that won't work, but we can work with it if it's off by a little bit. So next week, next we can actually start working with the actual chain that we want. So we want to have RDI. We want to have RDI at zero, so it does the prepare kernel threads. Do prepare or commit prepare oh, crits. That's all I called it. Next, we need to swap them, so we need to have RSI ready. Um, RSI will just have RSI be RSI, so it fixes itself. Then we can do the oops, exchange of RAX and RDI. This should then go to RSI. RSI fixes itself. We can do commit creds. At that point, we should be good to go, so we can do a swap GS. And then from here, we should be able to do just an IRET queue. Um, I'm going to make sure the swap GS isn't just swap GS, but actually returns also. Oh, it does a pop RBP. Can't miss that, otherwise we would miss our chance. So we should be good there. Um, next, we just need to modify wrap chain to include the information returned from, or information that we're going to put on there for our return from our chain return back to user space that's what i want so to do that it needs the cs registers which control state registers i think i'm not really sure it's going to need r flags a stack pointer um uh ss was I'm not sure what the ss stands for to say I'm looking at some notes off the side, and I have them all saved. But the easiest way to get all these uh, valid uh, values is to just use a function that I have just keep copying and pasting and using, and it's just called save state. So we'll have a bunch of just global variables, which I need to create. Lon user underscore cs. Yes, there we go. SS, SP, and R flags. SS, SP, user underscore R flags. So, what this is going to do is it's just going to take the current CS register, store it, current SS register, store it, uh, current stack pointer, store it into the stack, uh, and then push FQ will be the user R flags. No, pop Q. Yeah. Maybe R flags is the registers itself. And this just pops all the registers. Pop quad. No. Push FQ. Whatever. It saves them and we need them. Uh, what matters is as long as you just call it before save state. It doesn't really matter when you call it because it should have it at any time. And then we're also going to need a spot to return to. And we can just say static void. We'll call it just a win function. And within this win function, we'll do a printf say your current creds 
our person D and to get real effective user ID. And then we can do a system. Uh, let's do exec B just to. So there's a chance the system might not pass over the. Uh, it should pass over the current ID, but just be safe. We'll stick with this. Um, that should be good. So we need to fix this up or finish it. Change I write Q. I believe that the first address will be the win function. So I think we can do, we probably need to typecast it unsigned along. Oops. Long win. We do the user underscore CS flags. Next becomes the R flags. Next becomes the stack and then SS. And I think that should be everything. Um, this should be less than 0x200 bytes. So we should be good with that aspect. So as long as we set item.size equal to 0x200, I don't think we're really focused on bypassing a certain restriction at this point. So we can do IOCTL FD 0x loop code of address A. So this will create our structure or create the item with all this data. And then we can copy it onto the stack. FD 0x code leet of A. So assuming that this all is correct, we're missing some stuff. Item.size. Oh. A.size. Next is unsigned. Um, next is zero x leap code. Oh, I put an actual O. Need a zero there. Um, you spell exec ve right. Exec ve. Get real effective UID. Um, maybe it's just real UID. No, is it just get effective UID? Yeah. Uh, we don't need the real, that's only if you're setting it, I guess. Build, looks like build correctly. We'll attach. Um, we'll then do our exploit. So the first one was to create the first structure. Second one was to leak it. So we have our leak that doesn't look correct at all. So we have to figure out what we did wrong. But we did get a crash, so we did overflow it. So that's good. Possibly our size was incorrect. Um, I don't like that this incorrectly found. So let's change this base to weak. Oops. Oh, I killed GDB also. So now we need to reattach to it and add the symbol file again. That should be fine. Exploit. Forgot to set the breakpoint. Darn. Uh, set a breakpoint. Why did I lose focus? Um, thanks, GDB. Not that. Go add. Single file break at beta SCLTO. Exploit. So the first one creates, first, second one leaks. That's in the actual address, so that looks better. On our third instance, we are copying over our rock chain, so that should be fine to skip. And in this one, we're copying it onto the stack. So this one we actually want to walk through. Oh. So it's crashing early, and it looks like we're hitting a stack guard. So it looks like we're actually sending too much data. Uh, so we'll need to just... Ah, oh, why'd I kill it? Darn it. Didn't want to kill GDB. So we just need to modify our size. Um, I think we should still be within the realm of 100. We have 50 here. Oh, yeah. We're way under 100 still. 
build, run, target, add, break. That's why I don't like to kill GB because we have to redo all those commands every single time. But create, copy, print, then we actually get into the real one. So this should be the copy from user. So we didn't crash that time, so we copied enough data. Wait, why is that address? Oh, well. Maybe copy from user doesn't copy. Oh, that was just mem set. Mem, mem copy. Yeah. So mem copy returned the address it copied the data to. So yeah, we're fine there. Uh, prints out the string. We'll get rid of the mutex lock. Check out this. It looks like we're at zero. Looks like we're off only by one. So that's not too bad, I don't think. So RSP, there could be a chance that GB somehow messed, is messing up. Yeah, so it looks like we're off by two. So maybe that's just how, oh, yep, right here. So it looks like it truncated the second one. So it looks like we're just off by two. Ugh, I killed it again. So we rip two of those. Do GB again. Build, run, target, add, break. Um, you could, we could probably just set this up for an actual GDB script to automatically do all of those, but if I don't kill it, we shouldn't have to redo it all these times. Four, whoops, I went one too many. Now that I went one too many, I think it might be too late to fix it. Yeah, we're just going to have to kill it. Target. Looks like we got an infinite loop, loop though, either way. So create weak copy. This one we want to walk through. Uh, probably just do finish. Can't do finish. Darn it. Just really hoping just to do finish. All right, third time's the charm. Create. Oh, whoops. Got to do it first. Exploit. Create copy that and then we can go through it get down to this so we have a pop rdi pop zero uh it does the kernel cred which i don't want to walk through i don't know how yeah it's not going to correctly step through it either um that address doesn't even look right actually What did we miss? Oh, forgot to add the actual addresses. That'll do it. Plus 0x53 BB0. Plus 0x53 D00. So that could be one of the reasons it was infinite looping or something. Build run. Target continue. Exploit. So create, copy, uh, wrap chain write. We're actually going to write it this time. I'm just going to set up. Can't set that, I guess. So we come through here. Get to this. Pop our DI. We actually get to the actual function that we wanted. And the reason it crashed is because it went through the actual function and just went or continued. Uh, you can't next instruction once you hit this function because GDB doesn't actually know the context, so it'll just run throughout the whole thing. And since I didn't step instruction, it just ran. But we can see that the kernel tried to execute NX page protected, which doesn't that doesn't sound right. So let me let's check this real quick because we shouldn't. Unless one of the RSI is messing up, we shouldn't be doing that. So let's print out 0x% LLX newline of to RDI. So we can just break at it. RDI will go RSI. We'll do swap GSTend. I think that should be everything. So this way, once we're actually in it, we can set the breakpoints within GDB. Continue, exploit, create weak. 
we want to set a breakpoint at RDI. Set a breakpoint at RSI. Set a breakpoint at swap GS. Um, you got to be careful with these at or at this point because since the kernel is just so empty or not really labeled in at this point, you could get lost easily at where you're actually at. So we're at pop RDI. We can continue. We're at pop RSI. So this is after our kernel structure. So this is our kernel structure that's returned to us. Our prepare kernel creds, I guess, was returned to us. Pop RSI should be the pop RSI function again. So return should be exchange RAX RTI. Should be call. Should have been call RSI. Maybe that. Oh no, calls the address RSI points to. Ew. So we need a pointer to that address. That's not really as useful. So we could go around this by placing this inside the heap and leaking the heap, which doesn't really sound that enjoyable. So instead, we're going to find a different way to copy it out. So cop gadge. Oops, we'll go grep. Maybe there's a move RDI RAX. Bye. Uh, we only want ones that end with ret, possibly. Uh, that's useless, so let's get rid of the ones. Tech V that have call in them. Um, that's not helpful because it'll just zero it out all the data. Alright, so we need to get rid of all those ones. Rep. Compare RDI to RDX. Jump if not equal. Sort EX ret. This one actually should be good. Oh wait, jump if not equal. They're never going to be equal. Maybe that one's not good. Unless this jump if not equal actually beats there. So this one's a possibility. We'll come back to that. Otherwise, there could be a possibly add RDI RAX. Um, just rep, tech V, call. We don't care about any of those. Compare the value to RSI. Jump if equal. They shouldn't be equal. So this one should be good. I mean, there's a good chance they should be equal. I can set RSI if they are. So let's use this one instead. I'm just going to copy all this so I know what the actual gadget does. And we'll put it here. To comment it out. So we should be able to change this up a little bit now. Um, get rid of both of those. So instead of printing RSI, let's print out RAX RDI. So add RAX RDI. So we need RX to be zero also, or RDI to be zero. So just copy these to compare RDI plus 58, which shouldn't crash because it should be a pointer already, to RSI, jump if equal. Because hopefully it should be equal. That's going to be the one downside if they are somehow equal on the off chance. Prepared creds. Undeclared. Did I miss a semicolon? There we go. We can run it. Target. Target. Continue. Oh, yeah, that's the problem with setting a breakpoint at swap GS that it gets ran quite a bit in kernel space. Swap GS, don't care, don't care. I want to set a breakpoint here. Actually, probably didn't need to because we have the RDI gadget still. So first RDI, second RDI, I should put zero back into it. Uh, move RDI RAX, that looks good. Compare those two, jump of equal. It doesn't, or yeah, it doesn't move EAX, don't care about it really. Now we're in commit creds, continue, swap GS, pop RPP, ret, then IRETQ. And we can see that we're in user space now. But if we try to step instruction and continue, 
we'll just get seg faults because we didn't fix that CR3 register. So to fix it, we'll do the ret to user mode and I'll give it the address for it will be at, I already have it saved so I don't have to look it up. Um, oops. Ret to um is equal to base plus zero x two zero zero cc six. And well, before we actually get into it, I'll show the that's what this notes is for. It's the actual code for it. I it's what I've been told. So what I believe is happening is we're jumping into says right here but that does not seem right it has to be I think the actual since I was given this link that the actual size of the file has changed so we're not at the correct offset right here this is what we want so what it's going to do is it'll set all the flags where we want correctly um, it'll do everything and then it'll switch to user CR3 stack so what this is, and then just pops RDI and swaps GS for us, and then IRETs. So this is what we're actually jumping into is in the middle of this function instead of starting at the top, and this allows us to get the correct location. So yeah, we'll set a breakpoint there so we can actually see it happen too. F zero x percent L L X. That was definitely not the address I wanted. Ugh. Ret to um, then it can come down here. If we need to swap out these two, we'll just comment them out for now. Do wrap chain i plus plus equal to ret to um, and I think on top of this we're gonna need two just filler, because I think it's gonna pop that RDI and do another pop. Let's check. How does that pop? But I think there's one more pop somewhere that we need to account for. So we need the second, or maybe it just does it in an offset. Six two. Not sure. But it doesn't really matter too much. I think that should be everything then. So let's build it. Run it. Attach. Continue. Exploit. I'm gonna get rid of the swap GS one, which I think was four. Yeah. Set a breakpoint at this address. Continue, continue, pop RDI, pop RDI, and here we are in the actual chain. So what's going to happen is just move RDI RSP, and then it's going to pretty much overwrite RSP, so we can't use RSP at that point, but then it starts to grab all of our values off the stack um, and push them onto this new RSP, which RSP is this heap that I don't know why. Don't, don't ask me for the specific specifics, but all that matters is that we have this move RDI CR3 and it'll then or it. So it looks like all we need to do was OR CR3 with 0x1000 to successfully convert back. But there's a chance that it might be different every single time because for this instance, it was 2D800 or 8000, but there's no promise because I think that has to do with the actual chemu memory layout location, but I'm not sure. Anyways, hit swap GS, and then we get IRETQ, and we should be in user space. And if we step through, we should actually get a uh, sake fault this time. We can just continue. Um, continue, continue, continue. I'm just going to delete all my breakpoints. Continue. And yeah, it sake faulted. Nice. Hopefully that was because of something not related to it. It is crap. <laughs> Now it becomes the fun of debugging kernel aspects. Um, the only major difference I had was 
I did do system here instead of exec p. Bash. But, I mean, since this actually ran, but we didn't actually get our shell, I'm not sure why it didn't work. Because usually if you make it that far, you should be good. Exploit. Bin bash, not found. Okay, well, the good news is it looks like we're able to run commands. It could also be something with, okay, so it's exec v. Um, but we got to remember that we still have KSLR on, and we have it automatically set to root, so we're not actually doing much at the moment. So we got to set this back to 1000 to make sure our test works, and then change KSLR back on. And we can run it. Oh, no, we need to build it again because we modified the file structure. So we check our ID, nothing useful exploit and our ID is now root so we can cat the flick and that is kernel exploitation hopefully you guys learned something useful and it wasn't too complicated I just wanted to give something good but not too difficult uh, are there any questions uh, oh yeah I'm gonna take that no. as a no <laughs> uh, thanks for watching